Chapter 1 say state and religion? Yeah. Oh, well, at least we're there. Okay, now, I apologize if mine is different, but the point is that uh, I have my comments already in this one, so uh, I don't think I'm really up to uh, transferring them in this one. I should have just, um, I should have just done that um, handout book because I have this one in, that, in the handout book, but I didn't do it. Where is that blue book now? Um, you have it? Yeah. I'm going to pinch it from you now. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, you, you don't need it. Um, I should have done that. I, that would have been easier for everybody. Uh, yes. oh. Yeah, I apologize, but there you are. I didn't even realize that, you know, but I don't even know if they could have gotten the same per uh, permissions. I don't, you know, these things are a little bit, a little bit, um, Difficult sometimes. State of religion, human and divine legislation, secular and ecclesiastical authorities. To establish a balance between these forces so they will support the structure of society rather than crush its foundations. This has for centuries been one of the most difficult tasks in political life. How does that compare to your translation? Yeah? Did, yeah? Uh, oh, wow. Okay, political life, politics, it's all the same. Okay, I have the sign-up sheet here, so uh, anyone who missed it uh, can, uh, can come up. So, he's talking about state of religion and human and divine legislation, secular and religious authorities and so on. How, how, how are we going to solve these in the, pro in the, in the uh, situation of politics? Often it's been easier to solve, and I'll paraphrase in my words, this problem in practice rather than theory. Um, he goes on. Um, some people, for instance, have found it advisable to classify social forces as different, I don't know what he's talking about here, moral entities, specific rights, duties, powers, properties. Uh, but none of these really has been defined, he thinks, adequately yet. Sometimes we see the church moving into the territory of the state. The state in turn will encroach on, I don't know what, but encroaching somewhere illegitimately. I guess where the, the church should have some control. Anyway, finally, he speaks about another idea. I don't know if you have it in this paragraph or not, but at the end of that paragraph I have, he mentions freedom of conscience. you have that? Oh, wow, come on. <laughs> hey, let's not get picky here. <laughs> you want to, you know, uh, you have it, okay? <laughs> liberty of conscience. Actually, freedom of conscience is better. I mean, that's more normal English. And I think actually this translation probably, I don't know why they did another translation. I suppose the guy wanted to sell another book, you know. I don't know why they just didn't reprint this one. 
um, who needed another one, you know. But there it is, there's another one. And, you know, often when there's two competing translations and one's earlier than the other, then the person who did the second one has to deliberately use a different word. So he or she isn't accused of stealing the first translation. So in a case like that, he'll use liberty of God. It's freedom of conscience. That's the, but if he uses freedom of conscience to say, oh, you're copying the other translation. <coughs> Do you understand that? that? That's one of the reasons why sometimes you'll find the words that are used will be less specific in the second translation. Okay, he talks about despotism. You probably don't have despotism. Maybe you have some other word there. It has an advantage. It's consistent anyway. Um, it has a definite answer to every question. Um, same holds true for the constitution of the church. You know, it has a definite answer. He's trying to say. Okay, going on a bit. I have a new paragraph um, further down, but you may not. As soon as freedom dares to remove even the smallest structural element in this building, the entire edifice can start to collapse. And no one will know what's standing at the end. So, you know, you can't really start to remove bits according to these despotic institutions. And he goes on about, the, see, this is an, obviously a Protestant era we're in. The despotism of the Roman church has been abolished, you know, in most, I guess, the countries that he's talking about. But what has taken its place? Even in our own more enlightened time, things are still very vague, he says. We just don't know. And, and it's true, you see, things haven't taken shape yet. Now, We'll all have this. He goes on to mention Thomas Hobbes. You have that? Thomas Hobbes lived in a period where fanaticism coupled with undisciplined desire for freedom recognized no bounds. You see that? Is that a new paragraph in here? Yeah. Okay. So our paragraphs, to some extent, agree with each other, do they? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good thing. At least we're on the same wavelength. Like I'd ask you to read yours, but then I wouldn't be able to follow it. So. Uh, just have to stumble along with mine and yours together. So, um, Hobbes is living in the 1600s. What period is he talking about that Hobbes is living in where everything is in a terrible state and nothing, is, uh, nothing knows any bounds? Do any of you know anything about Thomas Hobbes? Well, he's living in the period of the Civil War in England. The Parliament versus the, uh, I don't know what you call the King's people, the Royalists. Parliament versus the Royalists. And he says it knew no bounds. Well, that's because there was war going on, but also in, there were all those wars in continental Europe at that time, too, Catholic versus Protestants and so on. So I don't think it's just in England, but Hobbes wrote at that time. And he's, uh, and therefore he took his conclusions from that period. Um, it was ready uh, to uh, stamp out royal power, overthrow the country's political structure. Weary of civil strife and inclined toward a life of quiet contemplation, Hobbes, he considered tranquility and security, tranquility of mind and security to be the supreme blessing. So this is what I've been telling you about Hobbes. So he's describing, he's summarizing Hobbes in this paragraph. So he knows Hobbes and he's picking up from Hobbes, who's living in the 16, mid-1600s, a century before Mendelssohn. Consequently, he thought the public welfare would be best served if everything, even our judgment of right and wrong, were made subject to the supreme jurisdiction of the, and power of the civil authority and spoke about, further along, a state of nature. You probably have that because Hobbes uses that language. The original state of nature of mankind is a state of general anarchy. Is that what you have? Or you have a different, uh, something you want to put a different? 
uh, a war of all against all in which every man may do what he can do, might is right. You want to read what you have there? I want to read your translation. The state of nature is a state of tumult, a war of all against all, in which everyone may do what he can do. Every thing, everything one has the power to do is right. Yeah, you see. So the guy deliberately trying to be different in this translation. <laughs> and I'm not sure. You know, you know, I'm not sure that uh, it's a good idea. But anyway, uh, everyone always prefers their own translation. So you'll prefer the one you bought, and I'll prefer the one I bought. It's just a human nature to prefer one's own translation. Mine's better. Yeah, it always is. It always, yours is always better. It always is. Bigger, too. That, yeah, that's the way it is, clearer and better. So you're in a good state. You've got mine, and you've got yours. So you've got double here now. You can't make any mistakes. So now you know all about Hobbes, right? Yeah. OK, good. So uh, he starts criticizing Hobbes in the next paragraph. He was insensitive to the need for civil liberty. Uh, all right was grounded in might, all obligation in fear. And this applied everywhere as far as he was concerned. OK, further along, Another, next paragraph I have Nevertheless, Hobbes' proposition contained a great deal of truth. Is that what you have? Something like that? Not, a, not to be word for word. Is that a good paragraph? Hobbes, uh, our propositions contain a great deal of truth. Is that a new paragraph? Or is it in the middle of a paragraph? Yeah, yeah new paragraph. What page is it on for you? 36. Um, the confusion to which they ultimately lead <coughs> was largely the result of exaggerated formulations which he used out of love for paradox. Moreover, in his time, the concept of natural law had not yet been sufficiently clarified. So that's the other concept I told you about, natural law. So we already have here freedom of cons conscience, state of nature, natural law, things I've already mentioned in this class. He's studying the same books that I've studied. You haven't, but you are starting to, should you go further, you will know where to look for these things. Um, so Hobbes still, according to him, did for moral philosophy what Spinoza did for metaphysics. Now, I don't know what Spinoza did for metaphysics, but he seems to. Um, he stimulated further inquiry, I guess that's what he's talking about. By saying certain kinds of things, these, these philosophers stimulated further inquiry. So that the concepts of right, duty, authority were defined more adequately, he thinks. And have become part of our language to such an extent That ob system is refuted, according to him. Well, I don't. We don't know ob system, so we don't know how it's been refuted. But we'll take his word for it. At least that's what he thinks, and we're just studying what he thinks. So that's his environment. He considers Hobbes extreme in the next part. He thinks that if a man is not bound by nature to any duty, there is no reason why he should keep his contracts. Okay, we're getting the social contract. Told you so. If, if he isn't bound by any uh, duty, naturally speaking, why should he keep the social contract? So he's trying to poke holes in a philosophical sense in Hobbes' arguments. These are just arguments, anyway. So I mean, I don't care if Hobbes is right or wrong, or Mendelssohn is right or wrong, or Spinoza is right or wrong. One is stimulating the other into thinking in the same area of thought. Uh, so look, if uh, these things are only built on fear and weakness, he says, then mankind doesn't get any closer to security. We're in the same boat today. Fear and weakness, if that's what a force of people not to develop atomic weapons and things like that, we're no closer to greater security. So we're facing similar problems, it just, we just put it differently. 
since he can naturally violate a covenant made in good faith. And we're getting people who, who think like that. That's how a lot of people think in many parts of the world. They're not obliged to uh, observe treaties they make with the infidel. You can make a treaty with the infidel, but you don't even have to keep it because that person doesn't believe what you believe, so you don't have to keep any, 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 any treaty with that person. These are serious problems, even up to the present time, and uh, since the forces that we're dealing with in the present time are even more uh, frightening, uh, the effects can be more frightening. I don't know what it'll be 200 years from now. I, uh, I, even, I, I don't even dare to think of it. Um, okay, so now he keeps on banging away at Hobbes here, right? Take another issue. Hobbes imposes strict obligation on the civil authorities not to demand anything of their subjects, which would be detrimental to their welfare. Uh, and he goes on to say that um, that's another untenable thing to expect and so on. So then he starts talking about Locke. You see where he starts talking about Locke? Mm -hmm. Locke, who lived during the same period, took a different approach, if you want to call it. I'm paraphrasing. And he states the name of the work, Letters on Tolerance. He defined a society, a state rather, as a society where men unite to act collectively to promote the temporal welfare. Is that what you have? Because that's a very important sentence. You want to know what, you, what your translation says there? In his letters of tolerance? A state is a society of men who unite for the purpose of co collectively promoting their temporal welfare. Yeah, it's the same thing. Ours is better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I already said it. I, I agree. Never mind. The point is that you can hear our Declaration of Independence right there, or our Constitution. We, the people, blah, 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 you know, and then it goes on. It's just total, out, you know, right out of John Locke. And Jefferson and Franklin, all these people, Madison, who were writing those documents, were reading John Locke very carefully. That's, that's pretty obvious. And so is Mendelssohn. So, um, therefore, the state shouldn't concern itself regarding eternal salvation. It has to tolerate all whose civil conduct that is within the state, within the society, does not interfere with their fellow citizens' pursuit of temporal happiness. That's why Jefferson put in the Declaration of Independence. You hear the same language, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To ensure these things, governments are instituted among men. When governments become abusive of these rights, it's the right of the people to alter and abolish. How many are familiar with the words of the Declaration of Independence? The, the, this is what's right here. This is what he's talking about. It's the same mindset, almost word for word, in German as in English. And he's even using pursuit of happiness here, isn't he? Whereas uh, people will say, well, the Americans have this weird thing, pursuit of happiness. That can mean anything. We French have liberty, equality, fraternity. That's a different thing. So like, yeah, okay, whatever you want to define it, it lets you lock people's heads off. It's, a good, it's pretty good, I guess. But the point of the matter is, uh, we like life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness because we're all Jeffersonians. Now, some of you come from, let us say, maybe Mexico. Others of you might come from Korea. Someone else may come from someone else. But you're all Jeffersonians. And if you're not, well, you're probably living in the wrong country. Because that's what this country is. That's, I teach a course, uh, some of you have been through it, um, American Religious Diversity, I'm teaching Walt Whitman in that course. Uh, because I think that's what American religion is. There is an American religion that comes above people's individual religions. And it's Jeffersonian, if you want to call it, for lack of a better word, even though he's not a perfect person, as we've since got to discover. But still, uh, it comes out of the documents that were set down for us back then, and all of us agree to follow those documents. So we like it. Our translation is best, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Is that the same thing as civil religion? 
I don't know. I said, I don't know what civil religion is, but it's the same thing as something. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, like he's talking about the civil religious sort of a construct, I guess, of Fourth of July as a holiday. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Anyway, you don't have to take my class when I read Whitman to you and you'll see what I mean. But I can't put it in words. I can only read documents that express it. To me, when you put things in words, try to box them in words, you, you were in that class. You lose it. You lose it. And uh, you were in that class. But if you let Whitman speak, the spirit comes over you. But if you try to sum up what he said, it's like uh, trying to grab a soap bubble. Unless you're like Whitman. Well, uh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> let him say it. I don't need to be like him. Uh, the point of the matter is that he said it in his own way. And I'm not going to kiss you on the lips like he would do, you know, with you <laughs> bad breath and everything like that, you know, his sweaty stuff. Said that the scent of these armpits, did he say, sweeter than prayer? <laughs> in song of myself. Yeah, well, that may be true, you know. He was trying to say that the body is not dirty in any way, is what he was trying to say. You know, and that, uh, he was one of the first person that actually came along and said things. History of mankind. So wait, how do you, I'm sorry, if we're off on the tangent though, how do you... Uh... Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I'm not giving a lecture tomorrow morning at uh, tomorrow night. You can come and listen to it if you want. Uh, Psych 150, I'll be finishing up my work and stuff. Yeah, I'll be working on some other stuff. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. 7 o'clock, Psych 150, you're welcome to come. Thank you. I've been three hours on Whitman and we'll be done with him. So. I just don't see him as being able to. Well, that's to too bad. That's because you know, I don't care what you see. The point of the matter is, if you don't see it, you haven't read him fully yet. No, what I'm, what I'm saying is that I don't see him as being accessible to the American spirit in terms of a civil religion for us, although... I don't know what a civil religion is. What are you talking about? You're using language that is... I, I said I can't talk in language like that. That's some, some academic jargon you picked up somewhere. What okay. class did you hear that in? American Religious Diversity. Oh, I don't want to talk about this old textbook that you... All right. I would use a textbook. What if I preface it with, I, I buy what you're saying. No, you don't have to buy what I'm saying. But go ahead. <laughs> All right. But it seems like I do, because what I'm saying is, I buy what you're saying, but I'm not sure how, how the... I think among hipsters, you can say, yeah, women is our religion, but... Oh, no, no, no. Hipsters don't know anything. The majority of uh, We American read Whitman the other day, and Whitman is anything but a hipster, because the guy is total patriot, the guy is... Uh, the guy is willing to fight to the last man for certain things. He's not a hipster. The hipsters are liars and cheats when they take a hold of Whitman. No, well, they, we have different they only take a hold of one part of him, the homosexuality and stuff like that. They don't pick up any of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I read people from his diaries where he's watching the, watching the Union Army marching through Washington. You'd never hear a hipster write about the Union Army and the men in the ranks like that. They would be out there trying to meet them in the in the back row, trying to bugger them or something. Pardon my vulgarity, but that's what the Beat Generation, Ginsburg, and all those guys who began that movement towards hipsterdom uh, were into. They were not into patriotism or anything like that. Maybe. So uh, I, I don't really want to. Uh, we'd have to read Whitman together, and we don't have time. We're reading Mendelssohn. Forgive me for saying. No, no, it's all good. Uh, I, 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 I for, but what I'm trying. To, well, I don't know how we got. Anyway, it's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> so we must tolerate all whose civil conduct does not interfere with their fellow Yeah, it's the pursuit of happiness, the American, you know, that's how we The state as state has no right to take notice of the difference between religions, said so, so, he's going much further than Dome in here, isn't he? Dome was saying, oh, let's forgive these people their idiosyncrasies. Let's try to upgrade them, <laughs> make them more like us. If we treat them well, maybe they'll behave in a higher fashion, you know. Uh, Dome is accepting the stereotypes, but he wants to upgrade everyone. He's like a, he's like a, um, um, a missionary or something like that. He wants to bring the poor savages up to the level of our wonderful society. Uh, Mendelssohn doesn't want that. He just wants what? Tolerate. <coughs> just tolerate us. If we are somewhat odd, uh, peculiar, bizarre, if we're not hurting you, you've got nothing to complain about. 
So that's all he wants is toleration. He must tolerate all whose civil conduct does not interfere with their fellow citizens' pursuit of happiness. Now, my neighbor in my backyard, who bought a house now recently there, he guffaws at two in the morning. He's got a loud, horrible guffaw. Now, I would never open my windows and guffaw at two in the morning out loud to him. And then his TV goes, he's one of those people who can't go to sleep unless his TV's on, and in the summer days, he's got his windows open. He's not even aware that the TV is going until two or three in the morning. This is imposing on my pursuit of happiness. You see? His pursuit of happiness is imposing on my pursuit of happiness. I'm ready to sell or go, or go take a shotgun and blow him away, or beat him up, or do something. But I know if I start yelling at him and doing that, it'll just get worse, you know, and there'll be, there will be. Uh, blood on the street or murder or whatever. You know, more uh, violent crimes and murders and stuff are committed between neighbors than just about anything else in the world because neighbors really get on your nerves. <laughs> and uh, that's why I always tell people, don't get friendly with your neighbors. Do not get friendly with your neighbors. Just keep them at arm's length and, uh, you know, just treat them respectfully. But try to get in a situation where their pursuit of happiness doesn't interfere with your pursuit. So there's certain rules that are observed. I sometimes put notes in their box and say, uh, you know, before you moved in here, uh, suppose everyone made noise all night long like you, this neighborhood would be like a jumping a lunatic thing. You know, so you're the, the, the liberties you're claiming a right to because you have property and you paid $500,000 for it or whatever, are actually, you know, only, only good because others are not observing them. Others are keeping a certain standard of uh, of um, behavior. That's why this neighborhood is worth or whatever it is you pay to, to get in. So you, you, you really should observe these standards if you want others, you know, to keep this uh, so on. This is all very important. Uh, it, uh, it produces a life of sanity. So it, it, in fact, the civil conduct should not in interfere with the pursuit of happiness. Others' pursuit of happiness. The state of state has no right to take notice of the difference between religion Religion inherently has no bearing on temporal affairs. Any connection between the two realms is a result of the arbitrary act of men. Now that is what he wants to prove. I'm not sure he can do it totally, because religions do sometimes, you know, have an effect on the temporal world. <laughs> and uh, you know, he's want to say where the Jewish religion he wants to, he's really going to go way out there with the Jewish religion and say it doesn't affect, you know, how we behave as citizens. Anyone want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Response, yeah. So it would be like a, if there was a politician who was of a certain religion and his response to something was trying to follow his religion necessarily rather than following uh, the Constitution. Be, but not, not that, the, no, like his response was to turn the other cheek because he was a Christian, but uh, the better response or the more politically acceptable response would have been to do something a little more proactive. I don't know in that case, and uh, that's, uh, I said, Mendelssohn's on very uh, difficult terrain here, so we're going to see how he gets out of it, that's all I can tell you. Let's see where, where he goes. I can't answer your question, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a difficult point. Um, well, now he's going to go on here. Uh, we have to distinguish, he says, on the next uh, couple of paragraphs between temporal and eternal, meaning, you know, you know, something that is uh, finite and something that is infinite. And our rabbis say life is a vestibule to prepare ourselves, etc. Et I, I, you know, who knows? Who knows what he's talking about here? So um, let's get on to the main points that have an effect on his essay if we can. Several considerations have enabled me to clarify my own thinking about state and religion. Do you know where we are now? Okay, you found that paragraph? Uh, there are limits, influences, effects on the pursuit of happiness in civil life. Uh, as soon as a man recognizes that he can neither fulfill his duties toward himself, his creator, and his fellow man, nor escape the oppressive misery of loneliness if he lives in isolation from society, he has the obligation to end this state of isolation. As, uh, I don't know what he's talking about and to promote a common welfare, blah, 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 blah. So he says, we all need society 
and we should be like Hobbes. We should recognize that, and so we have to give up some, uh, some, um, some freedom, I guess he's getting at here in his own words. <coughs> blah, 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 blah. Further along, man's rational actions. See, to me, he's trying to be rational, but some of the time it's all assumptions. Like, look at the previous paragraph. Human perfection thus requires both action and conviction. Well, that's not a provable point. I don't know what human perfection is, and I don't know if it requires both action and conviction. He's just stating that. I mean, there's nothing reasonable or unreasonable about this. It's just a statement of what he thinks. So he's trying to couch it in a kind of pseudo-rationality. But, you know, the proposition hasn't been proven or anything. So again, it's not totally reasonable, but he's a decent, trying to be a reasonable man. And I think we can see he's a very decent man. He's not a liar, he's not a cheat, he's not a scoundrel. He's not trying to work people up. He's not a provocateur. He's not going to behead anybody. He's not, you know, he's not going to incite people to violence and hatred. He wants to calm people down and to bring about a mutual toleration. Man's rational actions and convictions are determined partly by his relations to his fellow man and partly by his relations to his creator and keeper. See, he assumes there is such a thing as creator and keeper. A lot of people don't even know what that is anymore. So he doesn't want to go any, you know, step so far outside the bounds of his own time that he denies what most people accept anyway, that there's a creator and someone who, a guardian, someone who watches over you, a, a god of some kind, and well, hopefully there is, but, you know, one doesn't really know. And uh, I've lived most of my life and I still don't know. <laughs> and I doubt if I ever will, and I don't think anyone else knows either. Anyway, so he said, the former are the province of the state, the latter the province of religion. Now, so I've been taking my classes on the scrolls and Christian origins, and I over and over again tell you that in this period of the scrolls, Dead Sea Scrolls, early Christianity, the Gospels, and so on, there are two commandments, the love commandments, that they constantly are, are talking about. And one is... Righteousness towards your fellow man. And the other is piety towards God. One is love your neighbor as yourself. The other is love God. So the two love commandments are righteousness and piety. Piety is your relations to God. Righteousness is your relation to your fellow man. Look what he's saying right here. This is 18 centuries later. He's saying the exact same thing in just sort of words that seem a little more, you know, philosophically oriented. Yeah. That's your action and conviction. Well, that well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's what he's talking about. Here. Your relations to your fellow man and your uh, and your conviction and so on. But uh, th those days, they expect piety towards God. You did certain things, like uh, you prayed. You know, some people do that too. You, um, you know, purified yourself. You bathed. You, you, you know, whatever the things that the Essenes were doing, especially, and that's where you first encounter this stuff in Josephus, is piety to God. And righteousness towards your fellow man was how you treated people in the society. Uh, and I don't see any difference here. Um, frankly, it's really interesting that so little has changed in 1,800 years uh, in terms of how uh, they present these things. Now, whether he uh, is aware of that connection, I don't think he is. As, yeah, you're saying it action and conviction. I don't know what the actual German word for these things are. Uh, so one has to do with... Uh, relation with your fellow man, the other with God. One is, but you see, in those days, both had to do with religion. Neither really had to do with the state as such. State and religion were the same. I'm talking about back in the first century period. 
Uh, so we even mentioned church, synagogue, and mosque here. You can read this material, so I just want to pick out important points here. Moving along, two or three paragraphs further along. You, you read this stuff yourself. Um, each people, at each stage in their civilization, for each people, there, a different form of government will be best. So as, depending on how you progress, again, none of this is proof, it's just observations, social observations. And there's some truth to that. Maybe in the Middle East, the form of government they have at the moment is the best form of government. We shouldn't introduce democracy there. Because what's likely to develop is uh, fascism, Islamo-fascism, rather than what we're looking for, constitutional democracy. Because what will happen is they'll vote in a uh, extremist uh, party, and then they'll stop everyone's rights anyway. So, um, you know, constitutional democracy can lead to Hitler. Unless the, the, the institutions I've already mentioned earlier in this class are firmly rooted in the framework of the society and their mindset, I don't think that's the case in the Middle East. So I'm not sure you can get a real constitutional democracy in some of those countries without it being, I mean, a lot of people would like it, I'm sure, but without it being undermined by the extremists. And that's what they say in Baghdad a lot. Look, there's no security here. So in a situation where the Americans have not brought security, and they didn't bring enough troops in there to bring security, and we don't want to have a draft and put you guys all in the army, and uh, you don't want to be shedding your blood on the streets of Baghdad either uh, to, uh, you know, UEDs or whatever, they're IEDs, um, you know, short of, um, short of going in there and, and giving security, none of this can work. None of this can work, which is the problem. And um, again, I don't have the answer, but I'm just saying, maybe what he's saying is right. Uh, every people gets the government in the stage of their civilization that they deserve. Nevertheless, next paragraph. I believe that regardless of circumstances, he said, at least he says it's he's his belief, there's one infallible criterion for determining the quality of any form of government. In other words, uh, the government, that government is best, which enables every citizen most adequately to realize he must renounce some of his rights for the common good. This is Hobbes back again. To sacrifice some of his self-interest for the sake of others. That's important. And I don't know, he's criticizing Hobbes, and yet he's right back to Hobbes. All right, well, you know, we don't necessarily think we have an original thinker here yet. He's just someone who's applying these thoughts to the situation of the Jewish people in the late 18th century. And to the next pattern. Fear and hope are no criteria for truth. Either knowledge, reasoning, conviction alone can generate ethical, ethical principles, which by serving as examples that command respect will ultimately become generally accepted. Moral criteria, uh, what's he saying? What's he, I can't, no, give me your translation at the end of that uh, paragraph there. Fear and hope are no criteria for truth. Do you have any translation there? The end of the paragraph. Knowledge, reasoning, conviction can generate See, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not. Read it. Beginning. All right, well, just read it. What does it say? Yeah, try it. Knowledge, reasoning, and persuasion alone can bring forth principles which, with the help of authority and example, can pass into morals. Can what? Pass into morals? <laughs> well, that's as unclear as this, so we're both... <laughs> Maybe it's just medicine that's unclear over here, but anyway. What's he saying here? Uh, well, well, anyway... Isn't he making the distinction between what the government's about and what the church is about? Yeah, he is, but I don't fail to understand what it is he's trying to say about well, that. The thing that I got was that the government's about protecting your negative rights. Up to, like if you imagine a continuum and a dividing point, all your negative rights are protected by the government up to a certain point, and then after that is where the church takes over. Okay, don't take that. This guy thinks very abstractly. I can see that. You know, he's got a reasonable mind. We shouldn't be guided by him on Mendelssohn. Because my mind is not reasonable, and I can't follow him half the time. I anyway. actually read that in an old play. <laughs> okay. Another paragraph. So here, religion can be of some assistance to the state, just like you were just saying. Next paragraph. If we're aware of the character of a nation, its cultural development, its 
pros prosperity, increasing population, luxury, etc., makes it impossible to govern the people on the basis of their attitudes alone. I don't know what he's talking about. The state will have to resort to public measures, such as enforcement of law by coercion, punishment of crime. I mean, well, okay, fine. Uh, so the state coerces people when they're doing things that are criminal. Okay, well, fine. So finally, at the end of this section here, uh, I have a new section, The Origin of the Rights of Coercion and the Validity of the Contracts Among Men. Do you have a, still chapter one, but it uh, seems to be, I have it in big uh, letters. Do you have that? No. Before that, though, the paragraph before that, he said, here we have a first essential difference between state and religion. After all this, he's come up with this idea. I suppose he's proved it, at least to his own satisfaction. I mean, I'll accept it. It sounds nice. The state commands and coerces. Religion teaches and persuades. Oh, very nice. I wish you, <laughs> we only wish you were true. <laughs> Yeah. Would, uh, this is the ideal uh, thing, you know, religion is nice and just, uh, pers you know, uh, teaches and persuades. The state issues laws. What? Religion issues commandments? What's the difference? Uh, is that a commandment just a persuasion then, according to him? I guess it is. Action and intention. The state possesses physical power and uses it when necessary. The power of love is, no wonder they thought he was a Christian. The power of religion is love and charity. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's the best, the best, uh, the best state and situation. I hope, I wish it were that way. That'd be nice. The one abandons the lawbreaker, expels him from society. We have millions of people in prison here, you know. And this is what coercion does. Uh, but it has secured this right through the social contract, he says. Religious society doesn't do it by coercion. Well, it used to up till the time he's talking about. They used to burn people at the stake and every other thing. In Islam, they lop people's heads off who don't, uh, who don't play ball in the right way and so on. So there's plenty of coercion going on out there, maybe not in our time. But before his time, I don't know where he gets that idea. They excommunicated Spinoza in the Jewish uh, environment. Well, I think he's made. Let me, let me finish the sentence. Uh, Nor can it possibly obtain it by any contract. So religion is not a contract. The state possesses absolute rights, the church limited rights. All right. In order to clarify this point, let me go through the first principle to examine. All right, what were you pointing at? I was just going to say, I think he's making, I mean, people don't join religion because they've got, you know, no pogroms and... They're born into religion. Well, when he's, saying, when he's saying that the power of religion is love and compassion, I think he's trying to get at the point that, you know, I think you made this point maybe two Whoa, weeks ago. Don't, 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 where I you don't know my very much. Go ahead. Where you said that, uh, you know... I'm never going to get through this book at the rate I'm going. Fascists, go fascists come and go, but, you know, religious traditions have been around for thousands of years. And Did I say that? You said something along those lines, I think. Okay. And I think what he's saying is that uh, the reason these things have stuck around is because they speak to the highest ideals available to humanity. Well, the one, the ones we, that we wish, hopefully, that's true. And I'm not sure it is, but that sounds good enough. I'll accept that. But um, anyway, so these are not coercive. These are teaching. Okay, fine. Um, he goes on the next section there to define what is a right. Um, uh, you'll have to read that for yourself. I'm going to skip a lot of pages here in chapter one. But you're gonna, I'll let you read all of that yourself because um, uh, somewhere along, and I, I can't give you the pages, uh, you know, I gotta move along so I can get to chapter two, which I think is more useful for our purposes. Um, somewhere along about the middle of there, he says something, you can read all this yourself, he says, uh, one is the domain of moral philosophy, the other of religion. Nor does religion, the relation between God and man, impose duties and obligations upon man that are different from those demanded by reason. That's in a parenthesis. I mean, he didn't say that, but he implies that. Religion merely gives solemn sanction to them. And he says, I believe these notions are self-evident, like in... We hold these truths to be self-evident. That's what, again, Jefferson said. 
So the point of what, again, he's saying here is that um, um, he's, he's laying the groundwork, but I'm not sure he's proved it, but he's laying the groundwork for us to think that Judaism is harmless. Because he said religion, the racism between man and God, does not impose duties and obligations that are different than those demanded by reason. In other words, reason and religion are nothing, nothing in conflict, actually. Just that religion gets you there, as he says, quicker. That was what the whole medieval synthesis was about. From the time of uh, the Greek you know, Neoplatonists all the way up through the Middle Ages, the Arab philosophers, Al-Farabi, Kindi, uh, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, on up to the Christians, um, Aquinas, and so on. They, the whole point was there's no conflict between the truths of religion and philosophy. That's what they were trying to state. And they were saying only religion gets you there faster. So the mass doesn't have time to think all this stuff out. So therefore prophecy and religion get you there quicker. And But in the end it's the same truth. And that's what we're saying, the truths of reason, philosophy. Philosophical truths are the same as the truths of religion. You can read all the medieval authors. That's what the scholastic synthesis was, in case you've never heard of it. That's what it is. How many verbal scholastic synthesis? Well, that's what it was. That there's no conflict between the uh, truths or laws of religion and the propositions of reason, logic, or philosophy. Well, in fact, that probably isn't proved. Point, but never mind, that's nice to think that way. Um, so I'm skipping through here. Uh, just pick out another point here. Let's see, I'm getting to the end of chapter, yeah, I'm getting towards the end of chapter one. Two or three pages before the end of chapter one. Because so I mainly want to concentrate on chapter two. I'll do that next time. So we will finish Mendelssohn next time. Um, even though it looked like I wasn't getting anywhere. <laughs> we are going to get some place. And the main thing is chapter 2. We'll be able to do that next time. But anyway, that, I'm not finished yet here. I want to go as far as we can tonight. At one point here in the things I'm skipping through, he says, State and church are intended to promote human happiness in this life and in the next through public arrangements and institutions. All these are statements. Not a single one is proven. But he thinks it's all very rational and logical. Hey, it's a nice film. There's nothing wrong with him, and there's nothing wrong with what he's saying. I think we would be happy if it were fruitful, then everyone would be convinced of it, and we wouldn't have all the problems we have. Um, okay, so therefore, he says, and he's getting up to the main point, which I think has to do with excommunication, which he's very worried about. So all of this blather, and pseudo-rationality, which is a sweet attempt of a secular, quasi-religious man in the late 18th century, probably more learned than most of us are, um, gets to a point, the Spinoza point that we mentioned before, that Spinoza got into trouble for free thinking. And he wants to get to the point that he can't be accused of endangering his community with his ideas, that they shouldn't be able to excommunicate anyone. So he says, a little bit further along, neither the church nor the state has the right to impose any restraint upon man's principles or convictions, or to make his status, rights, or claims contingent upon these principles and convictions. So once again, he's moving towards, you can't, no coercion in religion, basically. The state can coerce. He says uh, the state can't, but in fact, in the, uh, in the religious sphere, it shouldn't be able to coerce. Uh, in this sort of temporal sphere, you know, if you've uh, beat someone over the head or robbed the store, it should be able to coerce. Then he says, to abjure or adjure any principles and doctrines, therefore inadmissible. I, again, um, you may have a better translation. I don't know what page it's on. It's close to the end. But anyway, the state, you, know, you can't force you to either adopt or, um, or dispose of any 
any, uh, any doctrines or principles, nor can religion, is what he said. And therefore, he finally gets to the point in the last three pages of this uh, chapter one. So you can follow me, I think, if you can find the end of chapter one and come back a couple of pages. Consequently, the state may compel its citizen to act in ways that will promote the common good. It can reward and punish, but bestow honors, etc. Uh, we must grant the state the power to use compulsion. The state must, by social contract, here's the social contract again, be defined as a moral person capable of exercising rights and holding property with which it can do as it pleases. However, Revealed religion, divinely inspired religion, is something entirely different. You see that? What do you have there? It's a new paragraph. Divinely inspired religion is something entirely different. Divine religion is far from all this. Yeah, okay. So I think this is better than that particular sentence. Yeah. That sentence. It does not separate act from conviction in the same way the state does. Okay, that's probably true. For religion, an act is the expression of belief, conviction. Religion is a moral person too, but has rights cannot be enforced by coercion. So he thinks he's proved that the state can coerce within limits, religion can't coerce, period. And then the next paragraph gets to his main issue. The right to banish and expel, which the state can occasionally allow itself to exercise, is diametrically opposed to the spirit of religion. So he's getting to where he wants. So yeah, okay. You, to banish, exclude, reject the brother who wants to participate in, in my religious devotions and commune with God and find relief for his burden, soul, or heart, this is not permissible. So religion cannot deal out arbitrary punishments. Um, only, it cannot permit this torture of the soul which only the really religious person feels anyway. Think of all the unfortunates, dear reader, who were banished or excommunicated throughout the ages, supposedly to improve their character. See, here's the point. Whatever organized religion you belong, church, synagogue, mosque, I don't see always who brings the mosque in too, that's interesting. See if you can discover more genuine religion among the large number of people who are banished or expelled or, or excommunicated or whatever. Excommunication by the church either has civil consequences or it does not. In other words, either there's a civil issue involved here or there's no issue. If it has, there's a civil issue. Uh, and excommunication brings misery and privation. It will burden only the noble person. On the other hand, if a ban has merely spiritual consequences, as many people like to think, it would have an adverse effect on, I don't know what he's talking about here, but he's at home and making his arguments. At any rate, how can anyone possibly claim that excommunication has no civil consequence? All right, getting to the point here. Uh, to grant the church disciplinary power, as I've said elsewhere, um, is violating a person's civil rights. So he really is upset about that. I don't know if he's proved anything here. You know, what banner excommunication by the church can possibly be without civil consequences? There is a consequence. Even in the area he talks about a reputation, trust, and so on and so forth. And to be a happy citizen, pursuit of happiness, is a consequence where pursuit of happiness is concerned. Your life, liberty, and so there's a consequence of excommunication. But those who probably wouldn't be happy after he was excommunicated. I wouldn't be happy, he says, if I were excommunicated, he's in blood. I would be really, uh, you know, I would be, I would be in torment next to you. You're hurting me. And I couldn't pursue happiness. It's my right. I can't do that. Uh, so there is a higher law which allows no society to exercise a right which is diametrically opposed. Oh, you know, anyway, it goes on. So that's really interesting uh, uh, in terms of what he's, uh, what he's, uh, what he basically he says you can't excommunicate because it's against the pursuit of happiness. That, isn't that what he's saying there? Yeah, he uses an analogy of turning away a hospital patient that's really, really sick. They need it the most, and you're turning them away. Did he use that one? That's somewhere in there. Did he? Because here he's talking about some wine or something like that, but I didn't know. 
break the barrel, but don't let the wine run out, or I don't know what he's doing. Chapter 2, we have about five more minutes, we can just do chapter, begin chapter 2. Chapter 2 is really full of good stuff. Chapter 2 is, uh, you know, I think next time we will be able to get through it and finish it up. But let's just look at the beginning here. He mentions Dome, you see. It was Mr. Dome's excellent essay, The Civil Improvement of the Jews, which really induced me to, see, you know, I'm not surprised. That's just what I just thought, you know, and he says it here, which induced me to examine this question that I'm examining. To what extent a newly established colony should be granted legal autonomy and so on and so on and so forth, especially whether it should have the right to excommunicate or expel. Uh, so he goes on. Someone who possessed this right by virtue of the social contract, next paragraph, must have seen and delegated at least part of it to, I don't know what he's talking about, colony. Uh, you ever different word for colony there? Or you, it's colony. What if neither state nor mother church has the right to coercion in religious matters? What if according to the canons of common sense, whose divine origin all of us must acknowledge the Satan church can claim no right in matters of faith except the right to teach, no power except the power of persuasion, no discipline except the discipline of reason? He is really enlightened. That's what we mean by the enlightenment, you see? Look at this. Common sense. Thomas Paine wrote a, 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 um, an essay that basically produced the American Revolution called what? Common sense. You see, I mean, this was a great age, I have to say. I mean, it really was a great age that we're looking at here, though we can laugh a bit at it if we want, but because it's so idealistic. But it's wonderful to see people so idealistic. You see, you know, common sense is the, is, is, is the divinity. You know, the French and the French Revolution uh, built this statue of, uh, I think, um, was it Reason or something? They wanted to put it on this big sort of mountain-like structure in the middle of Paris, Lady Reason, I think it was called. Later on, they gave us the Statue of Liberty, which was really a kind of a, a alternate version. But at that time, it was, I think it was Lady Reason was the goddess or god that they put up in the middle of the society, or common sense. This is the divine thing, and Satan and Church have to go according to that. On the basis of this premise, religious coercion, see how upset he is about religious coercion? Not just to convert or be a Christian or a Jew or whatever, or convert from Judaism to Christianity, but conversion within the individual religions themselves, that's what he's worried about. And the use of compulsory religious matters we recognize as a flagrant usurpation of power. The mother church cannot possibly confer a right which it never possessed or give away a power it unlawfully arrogated to itself. He's like a lawyer here. I have the good fortune to live in a country in which my ideas are neither new nor striking. The wise sovereign ruling it, sucking up to the principal uh, ruler, obviously, has from the beginning of his reign made it his goal to grant men their full rights and let us pay. Well, that's very nice. I'm sure he was a nice fellow. I don't know who the particular uh, temporal uh, uh, ruler was at this time. Um, men have been created for each other. Educate your fellow man. Tolerate him. He top quotes this sovereign. So he's has, it's a moderate person. He's protected the privileges. And, but it will take centuries of growing enlightenment. You see, the enlightenment was the era, that's what we call it for. Men will understand that privileges based on allegiance to a particular religion are neither legal nor useful, and that it would therefore be a blessing if all civil, if all civil distinctions made in the name of religion were unconditionally abolished. Well, he's repeating himself now, but he says it quite well, but you get the whole point here. That's what's on his mind. You know, coercion to convert, coercion to force other people to believe certain things, conversion within his religious establishment, all these things uh, would take uh, several centuries, he thinks, of enlightenment to get over. And you see what, that's our problem in the Middle East, you see. We, we, we're, they're not near that situation. And nobody realizes that because they think everyone's the same. And they think all the cultures are the same. And uh, the people in the liberal side of the government and the conservative side of the government just are not grasping the fundamental situation that they're dealing with in the world today. 
uh, weapons of mass destruction in the hands of people who have not gone through these several centuries. It's a really frightening situation. And uh, I don't have the solution for it, but uh, neither the liberals or the conservatives are anywhere near the truth of what the problem is. Uh, liberals don't understand, you know, that there's a problem out there uh, that's dangerous, and the conservatives don't know how to deal with the problem that is dangerous, and are not dealing with an effective map. Anyway, a couple of pages further on, the example which my critic used in order to refute the completely misses the point. He says, let us apply the author's doubtful principles to a specific case. Let us do this and then we'll go. This is a really good point. I don't know who this critic is, one of his opponents. I think this is really a clever example, and you will remember. This person, his opponent, whoever it is, I don't know if your book says who it is, let us assume the Jewish community of Berlin appoints a person to circumcise its male children, according to the laws of the religion. Oh, okay, uh, what they call in Judaism a moe. Actually, it means knife, because he wields the circumciser's knife. Uh, a moe, uh, someone who circumcises. Now, the Jewish community in Berlin has appointed such a person, uh, according to the laws, but his contract, there's a contract he's made, titles him to a certain income with the community and a rank in the congregation. However, after a while, he, had, he gets doubts, doctrinal, religious, legal uh, aspects of circumcision, and will not fulfill his contractual obligations because of his newfound religious uh, situation. Is he still entitled to the rights and benefits he acquired by his contract? Oh, so that's an interesting parallel. The person is, is jabbing at medicine. Look, here's a guy, I'll choose one of your religious practices. He's supposed to circumcise people. He's made a contract to do this. He gets doubts. He doesn't want to do it anymore because he's doubt. Is he still entitled, uh, you know, to uh, the benefits he acquired by the contractor? Okay, he says, when I admit this is a possible case, yet nothing is applicable to this case which this person is talking about. Here he's, here's his point. The circumciser, next paragraph, please, enjoys his income and rank not because he affirms and endorses a specific doctrinal position, but because he performed the operation in lieu of the head of the family, who in the Bible was Abraham did it, but he does it in his place. Should his conscience keep him from performing this task later on, he must give up his emolument, his income, whatever, for which he has under the terms. However, if regardless of his conscience, he goes on to argue, he continues doing his obligated task. He says at the end here, I think it's really good, a foreskin is cut regardless of whether the circumciser believes or thinks of the custom, just as a creditor from the court obtains satisfaction is paid, regardless of what the debtor may think of his duty to pay, uh, and so on. So, according to the laws of reason, anyway, he goes on like that. Well, that's an interesting example. His, I don't think he gets the point, frankly. I think he falls off the point. His interlocutor said, Here's a guy, you're, what you're talking about is this. Suppose a person stops believing and then no longer fulfills his contract. Does he, is he entitled to his uh, rights? Uh, Mandelson went on to say, uh, you know, basically says, he should just say no, he isn't. That's what he said at the beginning. But then he goes on to say, if he continues to do his job, regardless of what he believes, and that's what our situation is, whether we believe or not, if we don't hurt anybody else, if we, you know, observe the social contract, we should be left in peace. He should be allowed his, uh, his, uh, 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 amulet or whatever he calls it. Okay, guys? I, we will finish this next time, and then we will go on to the thing I love, the French deputies. And also, I want you to start looking in, uh, in, uh, in this modern Jewish religious movement's book. We definitely will be reading about, see, we're doing Mendels in Jerusalem. You have that in chapter 3. We've basically done chapters 1 and 2 here. Chapter 4 is the French Revolution and Napoleon. We will be, we'll, we'll be reading some of that material. You should do the background here. And then, of course, we're going to go into the struggle for Reform Judaism in Germany, chapter 7.
That's really important, the struggle for reform Judaism in Germany and the historical school. Those are two really crucial chapters. The struggle for reform Judaism and the historical school. We're getting somewhere, believe it or not. I'm amazed myself. I hope that you're uh, not too frustrated.